Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Look who I get to interview. I get to interview Henry Kissinger, who is uh, the oracle of our time, the most respected mind and voice in US foreign policy for the last 50 years. And that is why everybody wants to hear what you have to say about what's going on in our world today. But I'd like to start with a question, just because I'm curious, and I bet you all are too. Um, I want to know how you get your news. <laughs> Do you read the New York Times every day, or almost every day? Uh, not necessarily the editorial page. Not the editorial page. <laughs> <laughs> But the front page. Well, but is that how you get your news, or do you watch television? How do you get your news? No, I, I do read the New York Times. I read, I, I get my knowledge mostly from reading. Like, like and everybody, so my I, age and all. Yeah, yeah. I read a number of newspapers. In paper form. In paper form. Not online. Occasionally on, on the computer but it's newspapers. Do you watch CNN? Yes. Do you watch Fox? Yes. I'm just trying to figure out who I'm dealing with here. <laughs> Do you watch 60 Minutes? I don't want to know the answer. <laughs> He's been on 60 Minutes several times, as you all know. Um, so uh, maybe I should just start with a broad question, because I'm kind of nervous that you're not going to answer a lot of my more pointed questions, and you're going to figure out a way to... No, I'll around. do my best to answer. Okay, but let's place. start broad anyway, because the, the title of your newest book is called World Order. Right. And the world is changing quite dramatically. Alliances are shifting almost everywhere. So do you, would you like to start with a broad overview of where we are, but put, put the United States in the middle, where we are in terms of our alliances, the shifting alliances, and then I'll bore in on your answer. What's that? Well, I think the fundamental challenge of our time is that a number of cultures or regions are in upheaval simultaneously and are in contact with each other, of course, simultaneously. Yeah, why? That has never happened before in history. Why is the that? The Roman Empire knew nothing of what was going on in China. And up to very recently, as far uh, from a historical point of view, uh, the various continents evolved more or less autonomously. Of course, that was not exactly accurate. The Romans knew something about, but it was far away. And the actions of Asia had very little practical impact. Now, there are a number of upheavals going on simultaneously and a number of societies are entering into relationship with each other for which they have very little precedent. And that is a huge challenge. First, in understanding the relationship of any two societies to each other and the composite of these this is happening at a time of an extraordinary change, I mean, again, unprecedented change in uh, technology. Uh, I recently wrote an article on artificial intelligence. I know. I had never heard of artificial intelligence <laughs> until new. about two years ago. And I saw it on the schedule of a conference I was attending, and I thought, this is a good one to miss and take a break. <laughs> and when I, and a friend of mine that I respect called me at the door 
and said, this is something you might learn something from. And I got so uh, obsessed almost with the idea of self-learning uh, machines uh, and the impact on society and on the human mind uh, so that today uh, when you think of uh, of warfare you worry enough about what leaders are going to do mm. but when you have to start worrying about what the machines interpret their mission to be it's frightening or to define so that's a totally new world. And that is a huge challenge. You know, and I'm going to interrupt for one minute because when Which I, I didn't was. I not get you in here. When I was in college, I took a seminar, and the question for the semester was what has the greater impact on history, technological change or individual leader? And you had to take one side or the other and argue it. Where would you come down? Uh, I would say at the end of the day, whatever the technology, it has to be interpreted by the human mind. I mean, it, what you have is the philosopher Kant you said that what you see may not be reality. What you see is what you, the structure of your mind obliges you to see. And so at the end of the day, whatever the technology, it has to be at some point get a human expression. And I think religion, philosophy, I, I would equate, uh, will be the determining element. And so the challenge of our time is also, and above all, how we interpret the world in the light of all the circumstances. All the changes. Well, I think we could, you and I could, and the audience could delve into the technical, technological changes, but I think for today, we should concentrate on leaders who are taking us in directions we thought we would never be going. So um, let me start by asking you about the news of the day something that's really in our minds this moment. Every day we have a new big story, as you well know. And today's big story is about security clearance. So do you still have your security clearance? You know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I that's how important it is. <laughs> look, the way that issue arises is if they call you from Washington. Right to do something or to, uh, they will tell you what your security clearance level is or they will know what your security clearance level is. I know I have had a security clearance through most of my period and probably through all of my period. The way it comes up, if you have a security clearance, you don't, you can't walk into an office in Washington and say, let me see your classified material. material. The way it comes up is in relation to some task. The import, and, and when you are in, when you've been at any high level, uh, you're never without the knowledge because you can read, you, you can tell from what people are saying and what they're doing in the light of the classified information which you already know. Uh, so I don't think the practical impact is very great if you have a security clearance or not. But what do you think of the president revoking John Brennan's security clearance? Are you prepared to join other former leaders CIA directors in criticizing the president I think it is for doing wrong this. 
to lift the security clearance on the ground of either political disagreement or as a punishment. The security clearance is retained because as a kind of respect for previous, on the assumption that you already know so much that it's not something which you consider a big deal when you have it. So I think it is wrong to use it in this manner. Do you I think, think it is also wrong to accuse a president of treason when you have had such, but it, that is not justified. This should not be conducted as a punishment and so but, I, I'm unhappy, with, I'm uneasy about it. But so you think that, that Brennan went too far, but you think it's wrong that his security clearance was revoked because of it. Is that fair I, to say? I don't think, I think the security clearance should be granted for the purpose of the government. And uh, but it would you be. Would, would you criticize a president harshly if you thought he was hurting the country? If, I find if you thought he was hurting the country. Yes, uh, I would prefer to criticize the policy rather than the person. Mm -hmm. Because when you've been in these positions, there are going to be enough people to criticize the, the person. <laughs> and so my attitude would be to get into a debate on the issue, and I've done that periodically. All right, well, let's, let's ta then talk about what's going on in the world and some of the policies that are happening. But first, um, I wonder what you think, who you think is the gravest danger, what country, to the United States today. Some people think it's China. Some people think it's Russia. Some people think it's Trump. <laughs> but what do you think? I think our biggest challenge is to understand what we're up against. So that is an internal, partly an internal issue. I mean, not what we're up against in any one danger, but in the composite of what is going on in the world. And uh, where the complexity of it increases and our cultural preparation for it doesn't increase commensurately. Uh, but I do not agree that Russia is the overpowering danger. I think that China, by the magnitude of its effort, is a challenge we have to deal with for a long time, but I don't consider it a danger in that sense. So, so if I said what is the gravest danger to the United States, would it be something else? Or just that we're dealing with these unsure forces, as you mentioned, uh, that are say, making us unsettled anyway? The, uh, the unshaped forces and our decreasing ability to deal with it for inability from a common basis of comprehension. Right. Um, let me ask you about what seems to be the coming apart of the old world order, in which the United States was the leader of the Western alliance. Um, what we're seeing right now, particularly in Europe, but in many other areas of the world, is a, a new rise of right-wing populism and some fascism and anti-Semitism. And I wonder if you would talk about what's happening in that respect in the world, and if you see any similarity to Germany in the 1930s when you were growing up there. Germany in the 30s was a 
anti-Semitic criminal activity in, in its purposes. Uh, and represented a huge danger to the European system as it had evolved over hundreds of years. But it still was within the context of European type problems. It was about national issues. Uh, of course, Hitler intended to achieve a, some kind of global leadership, but he never expressed that in any conceptual form. He was just going to occupy what he could until he got to some limit, which he never conceived. I mean, he thought he could keep going across Russia to what uh, so the present, but it was not a, well, it was a challenge to Western civilization in the sense that if he had succeeded in his, in his efforts, it would have destroyed hundreds of years of, Came pretty of what we considered civilized effort. But it was not in the, the situation was not as chaotic globally as it is now. Um, but certainly he represented a monumental danger to mankind. But what, what about now? Give us your analysis of what's happening now and where it's leading us. In the 1930s, uh, Hitler was, in a way, an exception to the concept of world order. Uh, the situation became so difficult because the world order people did not recognize the magnitude of what he represented. So it was, in a way, a, a soluble problem. If when he moved into the Rhineland in 1936, the French had mobilized, he would have been stopped. And this was the case for a few years longer. So there were few people like Churchill, and interestingly enough, Franklin Roosevelt, who recognized the magnitude of the, da of, of the danger. In our current world, there, there is the Western concept, which has been a rules-based system operated by something labeled the Westphalian system because it, it, it was built in its, uh, its original form at the end of the 30 years war uh, on the basis of sovereign countries that were assumed to have equal rights and for which there was a, theoretically at least, legal procedure by which issues could be, mm -hmm. uh, would, be would be settled. This is what was explicitly created in Europe and America and then spread around the world through colonialism by other nations wanting to imitate or learn from uh, about what they were experiencing. That sort of system, however, has only really existed in the West, built on the equality of states, on, a, on a, operating on a procedural 
basis towards each other. And so now their society is entering the system, like the Chinese, who had never thought of themselves as living in a system of equality with the rest of the world. They had the conception that they were the center of the universe and that every other unit in the world was could be classified in some relationship to the majesty of the Chinese but, system. But so, the breakup of or the disintegration of the Western alliance is not but let, let me let me get it let me get at a different way. Um, and this goes to policy as opposed to necessarily talking about the leader. Um, but I, I, can you talk to us about the U.S. policy of antagonizing our allies? Of the U.S. policy? Of, of the U.S. policy, the U.S. actions of insulting our allies, of take, insulting leaders, of imposing tariffs on our allies. And here's a list of friendly countries whom we have imposed tariffs on. I made this list. I didn't even realize it was this long until I made it. We've imposed tariffs on Canada, Mexico, Japan, South Korea, Turkey, Britain, and the European Union. Now, do you think it, it makes sense and it's a good idea to antagonize and, and uh, go, perpetrate hostile actions against our allies? Is that a good idea? Well, the international system, as I described it, the Western, the Western type system, operated with tariffs until quite recently. The idea of free trade, which I favor, is one that developed only relatively recently. So the idea of tariffs as such is, has been compatible with the world system. The problem that arises now is the treatment of allies uh, on a bilateral basis in that manner so that matters turn into a test of strength within an alliance system so that it becomes very difficult to maintain a sense of cohesion. And is that a good idea? To, to bring us to a point where it, we no longer feel that we're a cohesive unit? Is it in general? In general, I would have thought, it is not, to answer your question, it is not a good idea to treat allies uh, in a manner which suggests that everything will finally be settled in a test of strength, because this is contrary to what the Alliance attempts to do. But we should also ask ourselves this question, or at least I ask myself this question, which is this. I was in the generation that formed NATO. And in those days, it was exciting to go to Europe because we were dealing with common projects. And it persisted for quite a number of years. But in recent years, while the alliance has continued and should continue, it has not been given the content and the cohesive quality. So that's not a justification for any one policy. But I think I'm very worried about the fact that if trends even before Trump continued, that Europe might gradually separate itself and become an appendage of Eurasia 
And that would be a reversal of most of our history. But should the United States be doing everything to prevent that as opposed to Absolutely. kind of I think that is, pushing it in that direction? I think that is a challenge. My po point is whether the Europeans give 2% more at one not to NATO is interesting, but it's not the key issue. What's the key issue? The key issue is whether Europe and the United States, in the light of the new circumstances, can find a common sense of mission and, and goal to which they can commit themselves with the conviction that existed at the formation in the days of the Marshall Plan. Do you would you like to see the United States continue to be the global leader, which is a direction we don't seem to be heading in anymore? Yes, I would like America to play. A because we've been role. withdrawing, Not, and I don't just pin this on Trump. This started during Obama as well. Well, I. I think leadership is something you earn. It's not something you proclaim. If you proclaim that everything has to be done because you are the leader, uh, that's not a strong and healthy position to be in. But I would like America to have the influence uh, that it had in the period um, can we talk about Mr. Putin for a minute, um, uh, and Russia in general, and Russia in general? Um, it was reported, I think it was by the Daily Beast about a month ago, that you had advised President Trump that he should get closer to Russia as a way to balance off and contain China, almost the opposite of what you had done when you moved a little closer to China to contain Russia. Um, did you give that advice and explain what, what your thinking was, if you did? Well, I can safely say that I have never attended a discussion in which this would have been appropriate to raise, I don't, I don't think this is the way the Trump people approach international affairs. In principle, uh, it's, this was not a true story, uh, but there was some conceptual truth in it in this sense, that I would like the United States to be in a position where it has an option of dealing with all countries that can affect its security and its purposes. And so it would be correct to say that I have advocated a different relationship with Russia than has existed in the last period in several administrations. Uh, so that part of the story uh, is correct. Because when you think of the impact of R Russia, just because of its geographic locations, on relations with Asia, on relations with the Middle East, and with its historical relationship to Europe, I would like to have, I think we should have, and we ought to get to a relationship with Russia in which we can discuss uh, our differing or coinciding concerns. Uh, I think that is important, but I don't put that into relationship primarily with China. I would want that relationship with respect to the whole 
global issue. Well, if you think that the United States should be improving its relationship with Russia, um, what, when you were watching um, CNN or Fox and you saw the Helsinki news conference, um, what, what, were, what were your impressions? Were you appalled? Well, or I, you... I, I have said publicly that I approve of the concept of the Helsinki conversation, and we, I would think well of it if the news conference had never taken place, that uh, I do not like the emphasis and the tone of the news conference, but the, the fact that a president of the United States meets with Putin to set up a system which permits the two countries to inform each other and to deal with each other at the conceptual stage of policies, mm -hmm. uh, I think is very important. And I have talked to various presidents of the United States on this subject with the same theme, that we have not managed to have a dialogue with Russia that recognizes the particular nature of Russian history and the purposes which can be justified in Russia. Are we, does Mr. Trump and his team, do they give too much do they, do they, I give the idea that Russia is far more powerful today than it really is. It's not a very strong country anymore. It is not a very strong country, on the one hand. And in some respects, it is a strong country because it has many nuclear weapons for which there is no long range purpose in the sense you yeah. cannot fight a nuclear war of the kind of the weapons they have, in some sense we have. Uh, we have not had a meaningful dialogue with Russia on the presidential level in, in a long time. We've had shots at it and then some event occurred that would bring to the fore some regionally local issue that would then destroy it. Um, I want to ask you about China, but first, uh, I, 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 I would love to hear you talk about similarities that you see between what's happening in the country today and what was happening when Richard Nixon was president, in terms of polarization, in terms of the kind of president and personality uh, who's leading the country, and in terms of the kind of pressure that a White House comes under when they're under investigation? It's a big question, but see what you can do. Uh, <coughs> My my relationship to President Nixon has to be understood that I spent 15 years of my life as the principal advisor to Nelson Rockefeller, trying to keep Nixon from becoming president. <laughs> and he appointed me in a generous act to a position that I did not deserve in terms of confidence oh. with the president. With this as a background, I must say, what I think, what I think about Nixon, I acquired for better words by experience. And therefore there's no comparison whatever with the approach of Nixon to foreign policy. Mm. 
and some of the current approaches. Nixon was a thoughtful student of international affairs. Uh, he was, became president in the middle of a war in which he found 550,000 Americans as far away from America as you could be in a conflict. And he made the best effort of which he was capable to try to develop an international system by which a more peaceful order could be established. The way when this war developed when I was at Harvard, and it began with teachings, which assumed the validity of the view of the other side, whoever was the other side, in the teachings. And by the time he came into office, the assumption was that anyone who disagrees with you is morally suspect and has to be vilified. So he also did not have the personality to handle these attacks in a magnanimous uh, uh, spirit. But all I'm saying is Nixon was a student of international affairs who tried to construct an international system, who opened to China because he thought this would be an, not as a political trick, but as something and the same with detente with Russia. Uh, the problem of that time was that we had war plans that were based on the destruction of humanity on both sides. Mm. And therefore, he considered it his obligation to see whether one could limit the impact. So Nixon had a gap between his personal insecurities and his sense of, of mission. Uh, so I am in the present world, there is a kind of division in which I would not say that the existing administration necessarily shares the global perceptions of Nixon. But they, do you feel that the, I, I, I'm going to turn to questions in one minute, but do you feel that the, that the country is in a similar place? I was around during this era. I met you way back then. And it seems, that the, to me anyway, that the country was almost as divided, almost as paralyzed, that people were at each other's throats in a similar way, and it did revolve around the president. You know, you're either for Nixon or against Nixon. There was an enemies list. There was huge attacks on the press. There, there feels to me that there's something going on that you may have seen before. Well, if you sat where I sat, uh, during that period, um, you did not, it was, you, you had a, a, an assignment to end the war, and you had a desire to create a new international system. So, I simply do not believe these were comparable 
situations now. Uh, comparable only in the sense that sometime early in the Vietnam War, we lost our sense of cohesion. And I would say that until we get over the Vietnam syndrome in that sense and come together again, we're going to go through these crises over and over again. Because when we engage ourselves, we do it for a great purpose. And when we get into obstacles, we realize that we don't have a common great purpose in that sense. And then the debate, uh, I've seen this now for 50 years. Uh, and so I would say that until we can find some way of achieving some common purpose and some definable strategy so, it, so that we stop the debate, is this or that foreign leader a good guy or a bad guy, and find some way of defining it in terms of some processes. There's a big risk that will tear ourselves uh, to pieces. It has taken an especially acute form now. Um, we're, our time is collapsing, so we're going to take questions. And while people line up, um, I'd, I'd want to remind everybody that we had this huge emotional bubble when Nixon was president. And he left, and Jerry Ford came in. And overnight, the country calmed down. So the personality of the president and the problems he's facing personally, I'm not even, I'm not talking about foreign policy, makes a huge yeah, difference timing. on the state of mind of the American people. It's true that we've had less passionate period than the present ones. <laughs> uh, but you are so diplomatic. Down, <laughs> calming down is the purpose of America. We have to express some strategies, some objective we have to that find we it. share enough so that we do not take the position that anything that hurts the other side in the debate is good. Exactly. All right. Um, <laughs> I very much appreciate, Leslie, your attempts to get some really specific answers. <laughs> and I appreciate Mr. Kissinger's decorum and feel for being politic, but I'm going to ask it really specifically. She's going to ask you a very specific question, and she compliments me for trying to get specific with you. But go ahead. I'm going to repeat the question. OK. Um, it's rumored you've had a meeting or two with President Trump. Have you? Can you say if he understood what you were saying? And would you, if you were in this position now, have allowed him to be alone with Putin without notes without support, even though you believe it's a good idea that they speak. Let's okay, we, I, you I heard that? With my I know, I'm going to try to repeat it correctly. Um, she's talking about when the president met with Mr. Putin alone, without any notes taken, and, and without anybody else in the room. Um, and, and was that a good idea? And, and should did that he have, have a meeting alone with him? What? And did Mr. Kissinger have? one or two meetings. Oh, and did you ever meet alone with Mr. Putin? No, with Mr. No. Trump. Mr. Trump. Did you ever meet alone with Mr. Trump? Without notes taken? Whatever. <laughs> two, so two parts. Did uh, you meet alone with Mr. Trump, and was it a good idea that he met alone that way with Mr. Putin? Well, first of all, if, when I meet with Mr. Trump, it is... It, I don't consider that of dealing with a national challenge that, I can, that one shouldn't talk to. My attitude towards presidents has been that I never request an appointment. Really? I 
they come to you? I come because they feel they either need my advice or they achieve some political purpose or they want me to do something. So when I, uh, so I don't feel that I have to take notes that I then distribute because I come as a private individual. I don't speak about it. There. Leave it up to the president. That, that's my basic attitude to Obama, to, uh, to 11 presidents that I've had an opportunity to, uh, to talk to. So. Uh, what about meeting with Putin? in the way he did? I usually meet with Putin. Remember, when I meet Putin, he's invited me. It's not that I've requested it. Uh, and we usually meet alone. And I reported to the White House, whoever is there. So, so uh, that is my attitude in respect to, to Putin. Um, but is it a good idea for a president to meet with a head of state? No, as a general proposition, I would say this. It is not a good idea for presidents to conduct detailed negotiations uh, altogether because they cannot get that much information absorbed. Uh, and as a general rule, presidents should meet to start a direction. And there it would be quite appropriate to meet uh, alone if the directions they then give are specific enough to conduct an, a development of a, of a of a uh, common policy. I think it is, first of all, one has to assume that you do not become head of a country without a highly developed ego. Mm -hmm. And therefore, to be opposed is not an experience that they cherish. So. One should avoid situations of confrontations, uh, and one should create an atmosphere in which it is at least possible for an agreement to be reached. So my general view, and I would put uh, the uh, Regent Summit in that category, I don't think it's a good idea okay. for no. presidents to negotiate final agreements, uh, but for presidents to assume ultimate responsibility is important. And to explain to their country, to the country, uh, why they're doing what they're doing, and to explain to the other side. Uh, and there, there can be occasions and important occasions for a head-to-head uh, -to, head -to -head meeting. I could imagine, and I've advocated meetings where the president says, I want you to understand how I think about this set of issues. Mm -hmm. And as our relations develop, uh, you should be able to interpret what I do in the light of what I've just said to you. And some of our relations at the beginning of the China uh, was somewhat on that basis. Uh, but Mao, uh, the Chinese, almost never have summits just between never. two people. As a general proposition, I've made my, my point clear. The president should set a direction. Uh, he, he should and leave it to the foreign policy people to carry no, it out. Uh, no, yes, the foreign policy people will have to give him advice as to the practical implications. 
and he can then modify it and should modify it. All right, we're going to get one more question in. You, you've talked about the com complexity of the world. The one part we haven't mentioned is the, the whole Middle East, Turkey, Iran, Middle Syria Middle East, Turkey, situation. Iran, Syria. Uh, so what do you make of, of that, and how should we uh, at the U.S. be part of that, or should we pull back as far as it looks like we're trying to? Okay. The Middle East, big question, uh, with all these different changes and alliances changing there. What should the United States' role be in the Middle East, and how should we be dealing with all this turmoil over there? And don't forget to leave Israel out. Now, the Middle East... It's the toughest problem for this, for, uh, for this sort of question. Because uh, if this were a discussion among colleagues, and there are people in this room who were colleagues of mine uh, for many years, they know that the first question that I always ask is, what are we trying? to do here. Uh, what is the purpose of this discussion? And to try to get it away from the tactical. Now, the dilemma in the Middle East right now is that, that some ancient cultures, like Iran, Turkey, uh, uh, some of the Arab countries, and of course, Israel are impacting on each other from different perspectives of their of, of their history. In my life, I have lived with an Iran that was a close ally of the United States because it interpreted the world the same way. Today, it is exactly. Uh, the opposite. But sometime on this road, it is important to have a conversation with Iran that reintegrates it into our concept of international order. Uh, and in my private life, I occasionally do that today, very rarely. So uh, we have, we are in the process, but we have now in various administrations not been able to define what our long-term objective was. Uh, we couldn't do it in Syria, which is ending almost the opposite from what we set out to do. And uh, so I can't give you a clear answer. I have views on pieces of it that hopefully will lead to some. Uh, but from a conceptual point of view, it's a very tough place. Wow. Well, I have 10,000 more questions. But see, we've gone way over. So I thank you. Dr. Kissinger, for your wisdom. We all thank you. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Thank you.